here's a question. What, what connects these names? Andrea, Barry, Gabrielle, Jerry, Karen, Lorenzo, Pablo. They are names of potential hurricanes in 2019. When we left Jonah last week, he was asleep below deck as the mother of all storms churned all around him and the crew. It was a a storm of hurricane proportions. Why did that happen? Because when we, like Jonah, run away from God, we often run into storms. Jonah ran from God, ran into a storm. The Los Angeles police got very lucky with a robbery suspect who just couldn't control himself during a lineup. When the detectives asked each participant to repeat these words, give me all your money or I'll shoot, he shouted, that's not what I said. (laughs) Owning up, fessing up, confessing has uh, been on the decline. We have made it an art form to deflect the blame, to deny the accusation, to dodge any responsibility. Political satirist Bill Maher says, weary of the self-serving mantra, it's my right, it's my right to have this, it's my right to do this. He said, what about, we've got a bill of rights, what about a bill of responsibilities? What about taking responsibility for our actions? What about taking responsibility for the things that we, that we do? In Jonah chapter 1, verse 12, in verse 12, Jonah incredibly takes responsibility for this storm, for this, for this potential shipwreck. How good are we at doing that, of standing up and saying, like Jonah, actually, this is my fault. Let me take responsibility for this. Jonah doesn't blame anyone, doesn't defend himself, but confesses to the crew, I know it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you, and to make it worse, not only does he confess, he says, you've got to throw me into the the sea. And in that confession, in that moment, the scripture tells us that the tide literally begins to turn for the first time in in Jonah's favor. He's swimming to survive, but as we'll see, he begins to swim to succeed. He confesses. Don't let the enemy, don't let the world around you tell you that that confession is kind of out of date, old-fashioned. It's a sign of weakness to confess, to say, I've I've messed up, that I've wronged. Uh, It's a good thing. It's it's, It's part of our church tradition going back to Christ himself, Jesus said that we must forgive others as they forgive us. We must confess, and that's in the Lord's Prayer. So we do that every week. And in 1 John 1, 9, it says that if we confess our sins, God is faithful, and God is just, and he will forgive our sins and purify us from all wrongdoing. There's no reason not to. And in the 1662 book of prayer in the Church of England, in which we have our denominational roots, there is this well-known, well-established, well-said, confessional prayer, most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and against uh, um, heaven in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we haven't done. And that prayer has been said for centuries and we say it today in our church. It teaches the necessity of regular confession of the practice of confession. It's a doorway of of grace. It's a restoration of our fellowship with God that sin breaks. Rogers Cadenhead, he's a successful author, he's a website publisher, and he is a self-described domain hoarder. He collects well-known website names before they become well-known. Website names like ibm.com and all these well-known ones that you see around. And in 2005, upon the death of the Pope, John Paul II, Cadenhead secured and registered the website address Benedict XVI. That was the name of the next Pope. It was his. And before Rome, before the Vatican knew that they should have that website, Rogers had it. And, and, and these sort of websites can, can cost thousands of dollars for people to buy them from you. But in an interview, Caden said, I didn't want money. He's a Catholic himself. 
It, he was happy for the church to freely take the website name off him. He said, I didn't want to anger 1.1 billion Catholics or my grandmother. <laughs> but he said, I simply asked for three things of the Vatican. One of those hats, a free stay at the Vatican Hotel for one night, and complete absolution, no questions asked, for the third week of March 1987. <laughs> what do we need to confess before God? When we do, it's part of who we are, it's part of our faith walk, we do so with the, the certain assurance that God in Christ gives us complete, absolute forgiveness. The weight is lifted, the peace is ours. There's an old ancient story that goes like this. A Chinese farmer gets a horse which runs away. His neighbor says, that's bad news. The farmer says, bad news, good news, who can tell? A few days later, the horse comes back bringing another horse with him. The neighbor says, that's good news. Uh, the farmer says, good news, bad news, who can tell? He gives the new horse to his son. That horse then throws his son off and the son breaks his leg. The, the neighbor says, that's bad news. The farmer says, bad news, good news, who can tell? The next day, the emperor's soldiers come to the village to round up all the young men to go and fight in the war, except for the farmer's son. He cannot go with them. That's good news. The sea's calm. Good news or bad news, who can tell? A large fish then appears and swallows up Jonah. Bad news, good news. Who can tell? Jonah is thrown into the ocean. Bad news? Good news. Who can tell? At this point, we should probably pause for a moment and look at this whole uh, uh, difficulty that many have with a big fish swallowing a man and him surviving in the big fish for three days. And when we read this story, this kind of twee Sunday school story, it begins to go from reality into fantasy. We begin to think this kind of belongs to the, the realms of Disney and fairy tales, and we think of Pinocchio and Monstro, and it, it, it's a hard story to swallow. But there are questions like this in Scripture that we have to face and we have to tackle. And as a clip from the TV show, The Middle, and the young boy, whose name is Brick, is like us, tackling some of these thorny questions of Scripture. Mom, you never told me church is based on a book. I assumed you knew. It's the number one best-selling book of all time. Hmm. Well, it's a real page-turner. I do have a lot of questions, though. Like Jonah, inside the belly of a whale. Wouldn't the whale's digestive juices dissolve him? Look, Brick, I gotta go to work. Ask your dad. And how could Noah have two of every animal on one boat? Many are mortal enemies, and the poop alone. Brick, it's a little early to be talking about the Bible. Ask your brother. Ask me what? Never mind. I'm sure you've never read the Bible in your life. How did God make Eve out of Adam's rib? I mean, if it's a cloning thing like Dolly the sheep, wouldn't Adam's rib just make more Adams? Brick, it's too late to start talking about the Bible. First is too early, now it's too late. When's the right time? Sunday morning, between 9 and 10. Between 9.30 and 10.30. <laughs> There's two responses here to this whole question of, of Jonah and the, and the big fish. Of course, it's not a whale. It never mentions a whale in the, the book of Jonah. It's a big fish. And, and, and if we don't believe that Jonah is swallowed and survives, then we create a biblical house of cards. If we can't believe this, then how can we believe Exodus 14 and, and the parting of the Red Sea? How can we believe that some instruments blaring for seven days brought down the walls of Jericho? How can we believe the miracle of creation, Genesis 1, that God brought this vast and complicated universe into being? But if God, who can do this amazing work through creation, that we are instantly and presently experiencing, then for God to bring a big fish along and for Jonah to survive it, in a way, is child's play for our Heavenly Father. We don't have to explain everything, but in faith we can believe. And, and secondly, and, and very important, Jesus himself believed in this story. So if we don't believe it, we're actually disagreeing with Jesus himself. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 40, for as Jonah was three days in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man 
will be three days in the heart of the earth. Jesus himself believed this. Back to the story at hand. How does chapter 1 end? It says that the Lord arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah. The Lord arranged it, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. I'm sure you've heard the story about the man in a town where there was a flood, and he climbed up onto his roof, and a man in a canoe came along and said, you need to get in the canoe, the waters are rising. He said, no, the Lord will rescue me. A speedboat came along a few hours later, and the, the waters are rising even more, and the man on the roof said, no, I don't need rescuing to the man in the speedboat. The Lord will rescue me. A few moments later, a police boat came along and said to the man on the roof, as the waters were rising, you need to get into the boat. The man said, no, the Lord will rescue me. A few hours after that, the waters were so high, the man was on the roof with his head just above the water, and a helicopter appeared, and a rope dropped, and the man shouted, you need to get into this helicopter, we need to rescue you. The man on the roof said, it's okay, the Lord will rescue me. Well, the man didn't make it. He ended up into heaven, and he said to God, I believed in you, I had faith, you didn't help me. The Lord said, I didn't help you, I sent you three boats and a helicopter. <laughs> what more did you want? And the Lord will find ways of rescuing us. We don't always identify, we don't always see it, we don't always know it, but God, there are no limits. There are no limits to how God in his love will seek to rescue us. There was an amazing story that came out of a remote corner of Ethiopia. In early June, a 12-year-old girl was kidnapped by men who wanted to force her into marriage. Incredibly, she was rescued by three lions. Her abductors had held her captive for seven days, but the lions chased them away and then guarded her for another half a day until her family and the police could find her. Police Sergeant Wandumu Wadeo said the lions just stood guard until we found her. And then they just left her like a gift and went back into the forest. Stuart Williams, a wildlife expert, said it was likely that the young girl was saved because when the lions heard her whimpering, they believed it to be the mooing sound of a lion cub. I like to think that the lion's rescue had a lot to do with God, who created these creatures, who can do all things to rescue his children. Did this great fish just happen to be swimming by? No, the scripture tells us it was divinely appointed. God is at work. Chapter 2, verse 1, God orchestrated it. And at different times, we need rescuing from an aspect of life that's causing hurt to us and to others. We need rescuing from priorities that are uh, misdirected. We need rescuing from a, a path that is taking us away from God, and God will stop at nothing to bring us back to him. God rescues Jonah from a life going in the wrong direction, and he rescues him from, uh, from guilt. Jonah is caught. He's caught in the belly of a large fish. He's caught in his disobedience. And the early part of his prayer in chapter 2 expresses that, that raw guilt he felt over his actions. He said that I turned away from your temple. I was banished from your sight. I was in great distress. A little boy is fishing and the game warden catches up with the little boy and says, didn't you see the sign that says no fishing? The little boy says, I'm not fishing, I'm teaching these worms how to swim. <laughs> when we are caught doing something we shouldn't be doing, there's this thing called guilt that takes over in that moment. Guilt actually can be a good thing up to a point. It convicts us of our sin, of our wrongdoing. It can get us back to God. Uh, last June 2018, the Minersville Police Department received a letter with a $5 bill attached. Dear PD, I've been carrying this parking ticket around for 44, ye 44 years, always intending to pay. Forgive me if I don't give you my info, with respect, Dave. The fine for the 1974 parking ticket was $2, but the person had added a further $3 for interest. I wouldn't want his interest rates. Uh, the return address was Feeling Guilty, Wayward Road, 
any town, California. Feeling guilty. Theodore Roosevelt once quipped, when they call the roll in the Senate, the senators do not know whether to answer present or not guilty. <laughs> we have guilt because we turn away from God. And until we turn back to God, that guilt will persist. It will threaten to overwhelm us. It will swallow us up more than any great fish or large wave. And in sending the great fish, God is not punishing Jonah. He's getting Jonah's attention. God wants to get our attention. Look at what he might send your way in the coming days and weeks. And he gives Jonah a second chance. Probably a third chance, a fourth chance. And God is the God of, of, of second chances. And by the end of the prayer in chapter 2, which he prayed for three days, wouldn't you get out of that belly? Uh, guilt has given way to shouts of grateful praise, promises to make good on the life God has given Jonah, and he says salvation comes from the Lord. And at that moment, the fish can no longer stomach Jonah. He, he is spewed up onto dry land, and for the first time since the story began, Jonah is in the right place. So the question is that we, that we need to answer today, what do you do when God catches up with you? And God gives you that nudge or gives you that shove in a, with a big fish. Our response is the difference between drowning in a sea of guilt or being rescued by the salvation of God that brings us, that brings us to the right place where God wants us to be. There are two types of guilt, two types of sorrow. Scripture says there is godly sorrow, godly guilt that brings us repentance, that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But there's worldly sorrow where we can't do anything with it and it just lingers and eats away uh, that brings death. In the bulletin, you'll see a prayer. This is one of those prayers that has been said for, for centuries. It's a prayer of confession. And confession is, is a regular part of the Christian's walk. And I want to invite you to, to pray silently this prayer of confession to God. Uh, to use this as a, a way of finding restoration with God. Say, Lord, you know, I've just not got it right recently. And, and to pray this prayer of confession. Let's just spend a few minutes. And I would encourage you to pray it through more than once. To let these words to sink in and to pray this prayer of confession. I invite you now to pray this prayer.